Hello, everybody. Is it on? Is it on? Hello, everybody. Yes, I'm on now. So, welcome to another uh, great observatory night. My name is Antonella Frusione. Um, I am an astrophysicist here at the CFA, working at the Chandra X ray Center. And I'm very honor honored to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Jonathan McDowell, who probably does not need a lot of introduction for many of you since he has been a speaker many times and uh, introduced many other times. So Jonathan is first and foremost my boss. <laughs> so, <laughs> so she has to be nice. I, I need to be very careful about what I say, but he's also my friend, so I have some leeway. So Jonathan obtained his bachelor in math and then his PhD in astrophysics, uh, all from the University of Cambridge, England. Um, then he left the old continent uh, for a postdoc in this Cambridge, and he has been here mostly ever since. So Jonathan studies black holes, quasars, X-ray sources in galaxies, but also develops data analysis software for the X-ray astronomy community. And he leads the group, which I belong to, that plans and tests the science analysis software for the Chandra X-ray uh, Space Telescope. But Jonathan is really known worldwide be because of his incredible expertise in everything related to space exploration and space flight, history of space flight. He is the author and editor of the famous Jonathan Space Report, which is a free internet newsletter that he founded in 1989, which provides technical details about every satellite launch. The newsletter is also translated in several languages with somewhat, uh, somewhat regularly. His website is not the flashiest <laughs> by any means. <laughs> uh, it's planet4589.org, but is the most comprehensive historical list of satellite launch information starting from Sputnik and a wealth of space-related information. Anything you want to know is in this website if you can find it. <laughs> um, Jonathan carries out his research on space history topics using original sources, including declassified documents from the Department of Defense and also Russian language publications. And by the way, the name of the website, Planet 4589, reflects the name of, of an asteroid, 4589 McDowell, which was named after him in 1993. Jonathan's scientific publication includes studies of cosmologies, black holes, merging galaxies, quasars, asteroids, and he has appeared in about every news outlet, radio, TV, online, discussing related topics. Usually we know outside his office there is a, there is a sign that says, do not disturb press or things like this. So before his talk, I want to give you a somewhat hidden piece of information about Jonathan. So you can see two buildings here. The left one is sort of a regular building in Somerville, and this one is a concrete building in Somerville. So why am I showing you this? So Jonathan owns an incredible collection of books, mostly astronomy, but many other books. And this building was too dangerous for him to live in because he was the problem was that it could collapse. On, <laughs> he was living on the third floor, right, Jonathan? Yeah, and that's right. You could collapse on the second floor. 
So he had to move to an old concrete building. <laughs> and that's what he did. So I don't think I need a lot of context for tonight's talks, expect, except for saying that we celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Lunar Landing. And there is no one on this planet <laughs> more suited than Jonathan to talk to us about footprints on another world, Apollo Plus 50. Jonathan. Thank you, Antonella. Bear with me my, while I set up uh, my presentation. Um, do, do, do. Yeah, so I'm going to tell you about Apollo. It's 50 years since humans first explored another world. And uh, I'm going to be focusing particularly on Apollo 8 and Apollo 11, uh, but tell you a little bit about also the race between the U.S. and the USSR. So imagine for me, if you would, a stone. 2,000 miles across hanging over your head. And imagine that you hadn't grown up thinking that that was normal. <laughs> the moon is ridiculous. You, we're just used to it, right? But the, if you imagine you came from another planet that didn't have a moon and you saw this thing in the sky, and you go, what the? So, uh, <laughs> so here it is, the moon. And you, know, you can be misled by a lot of diagrams that are out there that sort of suggests that the moon is actually not that far from the Earth. But um, here's a proper scale drawing showing the size of the Earth, the size of the moon, and the true distance between them. Uh, it's a quarter of a million miles. It's only a second at the speed of light. Ridiculously close by by the standards of astronomy. Uh, but still, you know, it's a, tr it's a walk. Uh, <laughs> And, but not, not, it's not ridiculous uh, in the sense that, I mean, how many of you in this room have been to Australia or New Zealand? Put your hands up. A whole bunch of you. So, you know, that's a long flight. It's kind of, especially in economy class, it's not that great. But if you imagine, you can imagine, in fact, some of you may have done going from Boston to Sydney and back a dozen times. Right? If you have relatives there, you may have done that. And that's how far it is from the Earth to the Moon. So it's not an unimaginable distance. And indeed, 50 years ago, we not only imagined it, we did it. Uh, so, um, and we did it at the climax of an intense race between the two then superpowers, the Soviet Union and the United States. And so, spoilers, the United States won. Uh, <laughs> but we forget now that that wasn't obvious in the early days. It wasn't obvious until right on the last day. And that's the story I'm going to tell you. So this sound was first heard in this room on, on October 4th, 1957. Uh, when uh, Sputnik was launched, the Soviet Union was the first to launch a satellite around the Earth. And in the early years of the space age, many of the firsts were, had Soviet flags next to them, right? Um, first satellite, first living being in orbit, the dog Laika, the first probe around the sun, the first to hit the moon, and the big win, the first human in space, Yuri Alexeyevich Gagarin, who flew into space on April 12th, 1961. Many of you may know space geeks around the world still celebrate April 12th as Yuri's night, and we have geeky parties uh, every year to, uh, uh, around the world. Um, so, you know, by, in 1961, it didn't look great, right? We had one win. The CIA had successfully recovered a spacecraft from orbit, which the Russians hadn't done yet. Um, but uh, uh, other than that, we were really behind. So President Kennedy made his famous speech committing us, basically, let's try something much harder because then we give us time to catch up. And so let's put a human, a man, 1961, sorry, on the moon uh, and returning him safely to the Earth. We already had a human space program. Mercury was underway. 
Um, and uh, on the um, uh, top left here, we have uh, the little redstone rocket that boosted a Mercury capsule with Alan Shepard to become America's first person in space on a suborbital flight in 1961. And then a few months later, in 1962, the much bigger Atlas rocket put a Mercury in orbit with John Glenn. And meanwhile, they'd already been thinking about how to get to the moon. And, uh, but it was, it was a real big challenge until uh, um, John Hubolt, an engineer at NASA, came up with the idea of what's called Lunar Orbit Rendezvous in 1962. And we're going to sort of learn about that later in the talk in more detail, but just to, it's important idea. So I want to give you an idea. The idea is this. If you, the, the, the obvious way to go to the moon is you build a ginormous rocket and you put a spaceship on top and you land the spaceship on the moon and the spaceship has enough fuel to get back to the earth and it takes off and gets back to the earth. The that, however, requires a really huge rocket. It would have required us to build a rocket we, we were calling the Nova. Hubbard's idea is you have two spaceships. You put them in orbit around the moon, and the, the one that lands on the moon just has enough fuel to land and get back up again. It doesn't have all the fuel that you need to get back to Earth. You leave the back-to-Earth fuel in the one that's orbiting the moon, and that way the lander can be much lighter, and it works out. The whole thing is much, much lighter. And you only have to, instead of having to build the super ginormous rocket, you only have to build the fairly ginormous rocket, <laughs> the Saturn V. And that's what we did. And so that was a key moment in 1962 when we decided to go that way. But, you know, early 60s, it was still, every time there was a, a new first in space, it seemed like it was the Soviets doing it again. Uh, as late as 1965, with the first spacewalk, this is a guy called uh, Alexei Arkhipovich Leonov. He's still around. Uh, uh, he uh, very nearly wasn't after he made his spacewalk, putting on a spacesuit, getting outside the cabin of the spaceship. Uh, he had to get back in through this sort of deployable airlock. So this airlock like expands from the outside of the spaceship. You crawl into it and go outside and float around. You squeeze back in. That turned out to be easier said than done. <laughs> he nearly couldn't get back in the spaceship, but he finally did it. Uh, and so he made the first spacewalk. Uh, but that was the last first that the Russians did for quite a while. Um, the uh, Gemini program started in 1965. And in two years, 1965 and 1966, there were 12 Gemini missions, 10 of them with astronauts on board. That's a lot of missions to fly in just two years. And in those two years, Gemini isn't as well known as Apollo, but it was a key step to getting the US comfortable with all the critical space technology that would be needed to get us to the moon. Uh, in particular, The, um, uh, the technique called rendezvous and docking. Imagine you're in orbit around the Earth. What does that mean? It means you're flying at 18,000 miles an hour. Now imagine your friend is also in orbit around the Earth and wants to get together for tea with you. <laughs> and, and they're going 18,000 miles an hour. And you have to link up. You have to match your speeds really, really carefully. And this is not easy. Uh, and um, it didn't always go well the first few times they tried it. So this was a real uh, learning experience, getting uh, uh, rendezvous and docking, linking up in space that was critical for the moon program. Another thing Gemini gave us was spacewalks. Shortly after Leonov and Voshkod, Ed White in Gemini 4 uh, got out of his spacecraft and did a simple spacewalk, but some of the more ambitious spacewalks that they did later on Gemini ran into trouble. It turns out, you know, if you're trying to tighten a bolt in space uh, while floating around, can be that you turn instead of the bolt. Uh, and uh, trying to walk along the outside of the spacecraft, you can float off and not get back on. And very simple tasks take a lot of energy because you have to hold yourself onto things. You would sweat, your visor would fog up, you couldn't see what was going on, you start to panic. A lot of the early spacewalks had a lot of problems. It was much harder 
than they had expected. Some things in space, which we did for the first time, just went smoothly, and it's like, oh, okay, I guess that wasn't so bad. Um, uh, the, I mean, it only cost you know, $100 million, but it, it worked. <laughs> and, uh, and, but, but this was one of the things that was like, oh, this is really tough. We have to think about this. And it was only in the last Gemini mission uh, in 1966 uh, where they did very simple tasks and learned how to tether themselves and learned how to use handholds and so on, that they really got it down how to do spacewalks. And that was uh, Buzz Aldrin uh, on his first space mission in, in uh, 1966. Did we, uh, we probably didn't, but did we share this information with the Russians? Did we share the information with the Russians? And not directly, but there was a lot of very public information in NASA's special publications. In my library, I have copies that, that, that go through all kinds of mission reports. We were very open about a lot of this stuff. Meanwhile, I want to emphasize how this was just, you know, you hear, okay, Kennedy said we go to the moon in this decade. At the end of the decade, Apollo 11 went to the moon. But, you know, it wasn't that, like, not like nothing happened in between, right? <laughs> the, there were hundreds of space launches and all kinds of ground tests, a massive, massive effort developing this technology. So this is just the rocket technology, the launches of the Saturn rocket. Each one of these pictures is a different rocket launching in the 1960s from the smallest Saturn I up to finally in 1968, the mighty Saturn V. And so all of these, these tests happened to, to get up to the point where we had a rocket big enough to send people to the moon. There were setbacks as well. Uh, and the worst was in January 1967, the Apollo 1 pad fire. Apollo 1 was two weeks from launch. And they were just doing a little test, no big deal. Let's go into the spaceship, check out the communications, we'll be home for lunch. And there was a fire in the cockpit, the atmosphere was pure oxygen, there were lots of inflammable materials in there, the hatch was a stupid design that was really hard to open, and the, we lost three astronauts. And it was just a, such a deep shock to everyone involved in the program at the time. Uh, because, you know, it's sort of like if people go up on a rocket into space, right, and something bad happens, that's terrible, but you kind of knew it was dangerous. <laughs> but when they die doing something that you thought was just an ordinary day at the office, that's deeply traumatizing. And so, so it made a big rethink of the program and made Apollo much safer in the end, but it was a very bad day. But by the end of 1967, the mighty Saturn V is ready to go. So this rocket is 360 something feet high, 3,000 tons. It's the thrust of the rocket is 35 meganewtons. Now, well, I'm sure many of you have a good feeling for what a meganewton is. Um, you know, but some of you may have seen uh, Elon Musk's SpaceX Falcon 9 rockets that go up and then get recovered, right? So this thing had five F1 engines, and each of those engines has as much thrust as an entire Falcon 9 of today. So this rocket is not messing around. It has three stages. Why does it have stages? Because when all the fuel in the first stage is used up, you're dragging along the weight of these tanks for no good reason. You don't need them anymore. And your, your rocket's trying to push along these tanks that you don't want. So, nah, get rid of them, throw them away, and just take the next bit. And so you do this sequentially, getting rid of more and more dead mass uh, uh, to get the most efficient way to get into space. So there are these three stages. And, you know, the one thing I want to emphasize is that not only is this an enormous effort with lots of launches, but it's an enormous effort in tens of thousands of people working on this program all over the country. Um, so the first stage was built, assembled in New Orleans. 
The second and third stages on the West Coast in Los Angeles. The design was done in Alabama, uh, some of the testing in Mississippi. And on the top is the Apollo spaceship. The main bits you want to know are the command module where the astronauts sit and the service module with the rocket engine that boosts them around and the lunar module that's going to land them on the moon. And uh, you know, they were built, the, uh, uh, again, in California for the command module, but the lunar module was built on Long Island. And the computer and software came from Kendall Square in, here in Cambridge, the Draper Labs folks. So all over the country, there, there were many, many people involved in Project Apollo. Um, if you're in this room and you were involved in Project Apollo, can you put your hand up, please? <laughs> One, two, anyone else? All right, well, we have two, at least, heroes of the 1960s. I'm, I mean that to you, yes, thank you. A round of applause. <laughs> that helped us get to the moon. And, and so that's, you know, I wanted to, to, you to know that because I want you to know that this is not just, you know, a few people in Area 51 doing it secretly or whatever. This involved a huge amount of people all across the country uh, who dedicated their careers to this, and, and we thank them for it. And not just across this country. Um, so this is the uh, USSR as it was in the 1960s. And I want to draw your attention to two places. Podlipki in the, a little village in the suburbs of Moscow, and an area that we now call Baikonur, near the Aral Sea on the desert in Kazakhstan. At Podlipki, there's a guy called Sergei Pavlovich Korolyov. And he is the genius of the Soviet space program. Uh, he, his team developed the R-7 missile that was Russia's first intercontinental missile that is the basis for the Sputnik launch vehicle and for the Soyuz launch vehicle that's still in use today. His team also built the Sputnik satellite, the first moon probes, the first Soviet spy satellites, and Yuri Gagarin's Vostok spaceship. So a lot of the early Soviet space program was, was under this dude. Uh, this is the Podlipki railway station I got to visit there in 2006. Kind of cute. Um, they're very proud of their space connection, you can see. And if you just take a little stroll uh, behind the station along a little path along the railway, you come to this rather nondescript industrial factory, except that if you look at the towers here, there's one tower that's a little weird <laughs> that if you zoom in, turns out to be an entire copy of Yuri Gagarin's Vostok rocket and spaceship <laughs> over the back. And that is the clue that this is the factory where the Sputnik was built, where the Vostok was built, where RKK Energia, as it's now known, Rocket Space Corporation Energia, uh, still today builds its spaceships. And up the street is this very 1950s Soviet office building, very grungy, that, that uh, uh, is the former home of TSNII, TSNII MASH, uh, which uh, was the sort of uh, headquarters and planning group of the Soviet space program. So boring as this, uh, this building looks, uh, US intelligence would have loved to have gotten inside these doors in the early 1960s. And then half an hour's drive away in beautiful pine forest, whoops, um, is uh, the uh, Gagarin training center at Zvyozny Gorodok, star town or star city, which is where the Russian cosmonauts train. And so they have mock-up Soyuz spaceships where the astronauts sort of train to use the uh, controls and uh, the, um, uh, the big centrifuge arm which whizzes round and round to make artificial gravity to make you think you're launching on a rocket. Uh, and so that was sort of this area in the northeast suburbs of Moscow was kind of the center of the Soviet program. And then you take a flight a couple hours to the south, several hours to the south, to the Kazakh desert, 
This is Yuri Gagarin's spaceship on the launch pad at scientific research test range number five. Uh, and which we now call the Baikonur Cosmodrome. Sorry, I, my accent's horrible. Um, it, it's, it's, it's an enormous place. Many, many launch pads spread across the desert uh, near the Sirdaria River. So big. This is Cape Canaveral to the same scale, right? It's like three times bigger than Cape Canaveral. So after a couple years where, where they weren't doing a lot, they were ready to test their lunar spaceship, the Soyuz. And they made a test flight in April 1967, shortly after the Apollo pad fire. But sadly, it too ran into problems, uh, had an emergency reentry, destroyed on landing. Uh, Vladimir Komarov became the first person to be lost during a space flight. Uh, and so that set back their program as well. But neither program was delayed for long. In 1968, they used a bigger rocket, the Proton, to launch a version of the Soyuz called Zond around the moon with, I kid you not, a couple of tortoises on board. <laughs> uh, why they chose tortoises, I do not know. <laughs> but that the point was that this thing had a cabin, bringing them back safely proved that you could send living beings to the vicinity of the moon and back and re re return them alive. Uh, and that was a pretty unsubtle hint that they were preparing to send people to the moon. Uh, so here the zone goes about a thousand miles beyond the moon, comes back, splashes down in the Indian Ocean, the Soviet Navy pick it up. So this is September 1968. NASA are very nervous about this. Uh, so uh, they decide, I wouldn't say panic, but they, they decide to really accelerate their program. Apollo 8, the first time humans would go on board the big Saturn V rocket, was going to be a test flight of the Apollo spaceship in orbit around the Earth. They said, nah, let's go for broke. Why wait? Let's go all the way around the moon. We haven't built the lunar module yet, so we can't land, but we can at least go to the moon. And so Frank Borman, Jim Lovell, and Bill Anders became uh, the first human beings to leave the Earth's gravitational sphere of influence and to orbit the moon. Here it is taking off. And here it is in Earth orbit. So this is what the Apollo spaceship looks like in Earth orbit. It's got the cabin with the three people on board, the engine. This flight doesn't have a lunar module, but if it did, it would be inside this cone. And then you have the rocket stay, the Saturn V upper rocket stage, uh, which still has 60 tons of fuel in it to get them out of Earth orbit and off to the moon. And so this is a 128-ton spaceship orbiting the Earth. Uh, this is not a, this is an artwork. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, good question. It's really good artwork. <laughs> um, and so this is 128 tons, but half of it is, is fuel in the rocket tank. They boost it out. Now it's 60 tons on the way to the moon, of which about 24 tons is the Apollo spaceship. So I want to give you uh, a, a little sense of the geography here. Um, this big circle around the Earth in the middle of the photo uh, is um, a million miles in radius uh, and represents the area where the Earth's gravity is stronger or has more effect than the Sun's gravity. Call it the sphere of influence of the Earth. And so the Sun, this is one million miles, the Sun is 93 million miles off to the right of this picture. Uh, and, um, uh, but it's so much more massive that the Earth only can win in this small region. And it's not that the Earth's gravity suddenly stops, right, at any point. The Earth's gravity goes on forever, the Sun's gravity goes on forever, but there's a point at which the Earth's gravity is so small that you can ignore it and pretend you're just in orbit around the Sun, 
And there's a point where you're so close to the Earth that you can ignore the sun's gravity and think of yourself as in orbit around the Earth. And so this is the Earth's gravitational sphere. And then inside this, this small circle here, marked Luna, is the sphere where the moon's gravity is more important than the Earth's. And so the lunar sphere of influence. And so um, our species has played around in this little area. We've never even been, except with our robot probes, to the outer part of this sphere, much less beyond it. So let's zoom in on this little region near the Earth and the Moon. So here's the lunar sphere of influence and the position. The sun is off to the right and the position is as it was when Apollo 8 was launched. So here's Apollo 8 a few thousand miles above the Earth. It looks like it's right on the circle of the Earth. So in this thing, here's the lunar gravity sphere, and the tiny circle is the moon surface itself. And so Apollo is moving away from the Earth, and four panels open up to separate it from the rocket stage. This is artwork again. <laughs> this, however, is a real photo taken by the astronauts of the discarded rocket stage. Uh, uh, as they, they left, and then this is artwork of what, what it looks like separated where the astronauts are. And so now they're moving after, so they were launched, let me just go back to uh, this one, they were launched on Saturday, December 21st, 1968, and I'm going to use Greenwich Mean Time uh, at 4 p.m. in the afternoon, and by Sunday midnight, they were this far away, making a decent kind of... Uh, uh, distance from the Earth, but look, they're not going exactly toward the Moon. And there's a reason for that, which is the Moon moves. <laughs> so if you, if you see the Moon and you start going toward it, by the time you get there, it'll be somewhere else and you'll be unhappy. Uh, and, and so you have to aim for where the Moon is going to be when you get there. Um, astrodynamics is fun. And so by Monday midnight, a day later, see Apollo 8's now getting close to this lunar gravity sphere. Uh, and it reaches it on Monday evening, December 23rd. And now for the first time, Borman, Lovell, and Anders become the first humans to be experiencing more gravity from the moon than they are from the Earth. So for me, even compared to the landing, this is the moment, right? This is the moment when we became an interplanetary species. At least a multi-world species. And so they start, whoops. Uh, new, new remote, I'm getting used to it. Um, so uh, you go, let's see, from uh, 8 p.m. Monday to midnight Tuesday, they're starting to fall closer and closer to the moon picking up speed. So you throw something up, right, really high, and it gets slower and slower and slower, and eventually it falls back down. Except if you throw it so high that before it starts falling back down, it's in the lunar sphere of influence, and now it starts falling up toward the moon, or down toward the moon if you're the moon. Uh, and so by Tuesday 10 a.m., they have reached the vicinity of the moon, uh, they're right there on this scale, but actually they're, they're 60 miles above the moon in orbit around the moon. They fire the rocket engine to slow, them, slow their fall, and now they're orbiting the moon in roughly a circle 60 miles above the craters. And as they go behind the moon, they are cut off from all of humanity. They have this 2,000-mile stone between them and everyone else. Uh, and then as they come out from behind the moon... They see on the horizon, for the first time, humans directly observe Earth rise. The Earth comes, to, as seen by them, above the horizon of the moon. And at the same time as this little splotch of color emerges, their radios come back to life after having been silent while they're on the far side. They're back in touch with humanity. Can you imagine, you know, what that must feel like? You've been so more isolated than anyone else in human history, right? And now you're back in touch and you see this beautiful thing appear above the horizon. So that's Earthrise. So they stayed in orbit around the moon until Wednesday morning. Uh, 
fired the engine again to boost themselves out of lunar orbit in what's called trans-Earth injection, TEI, because at NASA we love acronyms. Oh, let's see. It's about a two-hour orbit, and they were there for about a day. So, so you know, about, about of order ten to twelve, something like that. I, I don't remember the exact number. Yeah, they would fall towards the moon, but they were going so fast before they got into orbit that they would have gone right on past and zipped out into orbit around the sun. And so they had to turn the engine on to slow down and get captured by the moon properly. If they'd aimed slightly differently, they would have just crashed into the moon. So that would work, but n <laughs> not for them, really. <laughs> and, uh, so, uh, uh, yeah, if you, if you aim right at the moon like the original Russian lunar probes do, then, then you just fall, fall and fall toward the moon. But if you're smart and want to be in orbit, you aim to miss just slightly. And then you're going so fast that you have escape velocity relative to the moon. And actually, I think on Apollo 8, they had it so that the gravity would whip them around and send them back to Earth, even if the engine failed. So that was the safe. For the first few Apollo missions, they had a special trajectory called free return, where they would go around the moon. And if the engine didn't work, they would come back to Earth automatically. Uh, and then uh, I think Apollo 13 ironically, was the first one where they went, nah, we don't need to do that anymore. We'll, 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 we'll get on a trajectory that will send us out into deep space forever. And then that was, of course, when Apollo 13 had its problem. Um, so, uh, but then they met the, the lunar module engine got them back on track. So by, um, uh, by 12 hours after launch from lunar orbit, they'd escaped back into the Earth's gravitational field. And so now... They're very slowly starting to fall toward the Earth. And faster and faster until by Friday lunchtime, they're about to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere at 25,000 miles an hour. And you better hope the heat shield is pointing in the right direction. Because you get surrounded by a ball of fire and then, yeah, if all goes well, as it did, you splash down in the Pacific and get picked up by the U.S. Navy. And, you know, their heat shield, right, starts off about this thick. It's basically like rubber. And it burns away so that by the end of reentry, it's about this thick. So they, they calculate it pretty, pretty finely. So, great, we'd send people to the vicinity of the moon and back by Christmas 1968. But we haven't kind of won yet, because you really need to get people on the surface. That was the feeling. And so the Russians were still in the game, and very much so, uh, in 1969. This is their N1 rocket, their equivalent of the Saturn V. Um, and so uh, the CIA, well, the, the National Reconnaissance Office in June of 1969 returned this fuzzy photograph. It's a bit fuzzy, but give a break. This is taken of a rocket in Russia from space by a U.S. spy satellite in 1969. So that's not bad. Uh, recently declassified. And uh, so, so they saw this and they went, oh, boy, <laughs> we're really in a race there. And, you know, this rocket was actually gonna, going to go on a test flight without astronauts. But the U.S. didn't know that. So they were worried that the Russians would pull a a really gutsy, you know, let's launch them on the first one and, and, uh, and beat Apollo 11. So that was nervous making. Uh, but when the next spy satellite went over, all they saw at that point was a big burn scar <laughs> that the launch on July 3rd did not go so well. Here's the rocket. Here it is taking off. And actually, this is capturing it at the moment when the escape tower fires to pull the cabin away from the rocket just as the rocket falls back to the launch pad and blows up with an energy of one-third of a Hiroshima. Um, there's a lot of bang in one of these things. We're glad the Saturn V never did this. So this was not a... This was what is technically known in the space program as a bad day. <laughs> 
uh, for the Russians. And um, so that set them back, but not for long. Uh, they did a quick propaganda rewrite because they never admitted that they were sending people to the moon. So they quickly pivoted to, nah, people's a stupid idea. Let's send robots to the moon. The Americans can waste their money on people. We're going to get back lunar soil using robots. And so they launched Luna 15, July 13, 1969. And uh, here's Luna 15. And the idea is that it scoops up soil from the surface, puts in this little red return capsule. The upper part of this takes off, comes back to the Earth. And they, uh, when they actually pulled this off in 1970 in a later mission, this is the return capsule landing in the Soviet Union with a few grams of lunar soil. So very, very ambitious uh, uh, mission for the day, uh, given the state of robotics. Uh, so, um, so Luna 15 is on its way to the moon. And on Wednesday, July 16, the launch of Apollo 11, humanity's first serious attempt to land humans on the lunar surface. And again, I've just reused the same picture because it's art. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, um, the Apollo, this time there's a lunar module inside here. The, uh, the Apollo uh, is in orbit around the Earth. It refires uh, the Saturn rocket engine to boost it uh, out into uh, escape velocity at uh, um, uh, about three hours after launch. But it's not quite escape velocity. It has a, a, an orbit with an apogee of half a million kilometers well beyond the moon. And then, again, you see these pedals separate to release the command module. But this time, the lunar module is sitting in the upper stage. So this is a photo from a later mission showing when the command module does a 180 degree and turns around, it sees the lunar module in the upper stage. And it goes in and links up with it and extracts it from the rocket stage. And so now you have the full Apollo spaceship consisting of the command and service module and the lunar module nose to nose. So the astronauts, the three astronauts in Apollo are Armstrong, Aldrin, and Collins. Collins stays in the command module. Armstrong and Aldrin go into the lunar module. And uh, they, uh, they break into lunar orbit on Saturday, July 19th, about 100 kilometers, 60 miles above the moon. And then the next day, Sunday, July 20, Luna 15 is already in orbit around the moon. It got there first, and it lowers its orbit to only 16 kilometers from the surface. What is it up to? And at this stage, right, people didn't know what the Russians were up to. There were even, you know, there was the sort of level of paranoia of maybe Luna 15 is going to, like, attack Apollo 11. <laughs> or, uh, you know, people were, were that worried. And, and um, uh, uh, but the, the good bet, which was right, is that they were trying to beat Apollo 11 back to Earth with lunar soil. Uh, and so, um, nevertheless, Apollo went ahead. On Sunday afternoon, the, uh, the command and service module, nicknamed Columbia, separated. This is actually a different one, but never mind. Separated from, this is the Eagle, Lunar Module 5, with Armstrong and Aldrin in it. And you can see the, uh, the ladder that he's going to walk down from the hatch onto the surface. And the Lunar Module has two pieces. It has an ascent stage and a descent stage. So the descent stage is an engine that's going to land them on the surface, and then it's going to be the launch pad for the ascent stage, which is going to get them back home. The, the, peop the cabin's in the ascent stage. Go, so, go for landing. Retro. Go. Fido. Go. Guidance. Go. Control. Go. Telcom. Go. GNC. Go. Ecom. Go. Surgeon. Go. Capcom, or go for landing. That's just that that I don't know, I'm sorry, that just does it for me. You know, no, no, it's like it's so Thunderbirds. It's 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 uh Cap Gom or Go for Landing. So that was the decision that we would carry on the descent and land on the lunar surface. This is the view outside of the cabin. And it was a nail biter 
down to the last. Um, and so you hear Houston uh, on Sunday at 8.17 p.m. going 30 seconds, which is their uh, quiet way of saying, um, excuse me, Neil, you have 30 seconds of fuel left, so you better get your something in gear and get down on the surface. <laughs> um, and then you hear oh, immediately afterwards, contact light, okay, engine stop. Uh, and the contact light there, beneath the lunar module, there's a little wire making electrical contact with the lunar surface. They fall the last few feet. We copy you down, Eagle. Houston, tranquility base here. The Eagle has landed. And a few hours later, Monday, July 21st, Armstrong steps on the surface. Aldrin, here, seen here a little later, uh, um, joins him shortly afterwards. Uh, this uh, little pack on his back providing the oxygen to keep him alive. And so here is that famous first footprint. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. And, you know, the live TV from the lunar surface was really, really poor, uh, <laughs> but amazing nonetheless, right? And so, you know, we saw this, and, and this is, like, way better than what I saw on my TV as a nine-year-old. <laughs> um, uh, it was sort of fuzzy and, and snowy, and the astronauts looked like ghosts. Uh, and you can just sort of make out that's a flag, and there's a couple people moving around there. But, hey, it was live from another world, and we've never seen that before. Uh, and, of course, they brought still photographs home with them, so now we have much better photographs of what happened. But, but what we had at the time was that TV, and it was, that was you know, amazing but hard to watch. Um, so here we are on the moon, uh, uh, setting up experiments that are still there, uh, including a laser reflector that we use to measure the distance to the moon. Um, and then here is Neil Armstrong back in the cabin after his moonwalk, looking kind of tired and happy. Uh, Monday morning, Buzz Aldrin. Uh, so these photos, right, were taken aboard the Eagle on the moon in July 1969. What a moment. And then, while they're recovering from their moonwalk, Still on the lunar surface, Luna 15 ignites its landing engine. I'm so sorry. Uh, and, um, uh, and starts to descend towards the Mare Crisium, the Sea of Crises. Very appropriate. And then the Soviet news agency TASS announces the probe left orbit and reached the lunar surface at the predetermined time, a predetermined place, and the work of the probe is over. Yay! And British radio astronomers, my colleagues at Jodrell Bank, pointed out that they had tracked the radio signal from the probe and measured its speed, and that it had landed at a speed of 300 miles an hour, and there probably wasn't very much of it left. <laughs> so um, that was the end of the, lunar, of the Soviet challenge to Apollo, uh, uh, strewn in very little pieces across the, the Sea of Crises. Uh, so Apollo 11 had one, and all we needed to do was... Mission arm is out. Okay, I'm going to get the pro. 99, proceeded. 3, 2, 1. Ignition. Right away, Houston. That's your good. Excellent. That's what taking off from the moon looks like. That's actually Apollo 17, but... Uh, there you have good thrust. By Apollo 17, we had a, a little rover that had a camera that we could take pictures of the launch. So, But yeah, so taking off from the moon uh, on Monday evening, using the descent stage as a launch pad. And then the ascent stage gets into orbit around the moon again, near where Mike Collins is in the, in the command module, the mothership. Link up, because this, this thing has no heat shield. If they can't get back to Mike... They're screwed because they, 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 they're not coming home. They don't, have, they don't even have the engine to get them out of lunar orbit. So, um, so they link up with the Columbia. They, they go again for trans-Earth injection, boosting the rocket, uh, boosting the command module back towards Earth, leaving Eagle, the lunar module, orbiting the moon. 
where it stays for a few months before, untracked and unloved, it crashes somewhere on the lunar surface. So here is the crescent Earth as we approach back home. This is what the uh, Commander Service Module looks like on its own. And they survive the searing reentry again, splash down in the Pacific. Completing Kennedy, the last part of Kennedy's very carefully crafted promise that, oh yeah, don't forget, you have to return them safely to the Earth. <laughs> Not enough just to get them there. Um, and you'll see that the uh, divers are in these weird suits uh, that they also put the astronauts in right away. And they transfer them to this trailer, which is a biological isolation facility, because we were pretty darn sure there was no life on the moon. But, <laughs> just in case, uh, they kept them in quarantine for a couple of weeks just to make sure there were no weird moon bugs. They'd been watch reading too many science fiction movies. Or, um, and so, so, they were stuck in this uh, trailer, uh, which protected us from them and them from Richard Nixon. Uh, sorry. Uh, and then finally, they were let out for their parade in, uh, in August. Um, and so the Apollo 11 mission was done, and they had the precious moon rocks uh, that are still being analyzed today. And of course, Apollo 11 was not quite the end. For the next three years, we had six more human expeditions to the vicinity of the moon, five of which successfully landed on the moon and completed their missions. And then there was the one where I hope you've all seen the Tom Hanks movie. <laughs> if not, Apollo 13, great movie. You've got to see it. Um, and so... Uh, um, the, uh, uh, there, by the way, I want to point out astronaut John Young demonstrating he can salute while jumping many feet in the air in the lunar gravity, <laughs> or not air, in, in vacuum, or whatever. Um, here is the lunar rover that they drove around. Whoa, 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 whoa. Spoilers. Right, here we go. Um, and then that wasn't quite the end. Because the Russians were still trying. Uh, do I have time? Yeah, okay. Um, so uh, the moon rocket they had was another, uh, they had a three stage moon rocket and a spaceship like the Apollo, but much more complicated. Uh, and the guy who did the first spacewalk, Alexei Leonov, was going to be the guy on the moon. Their, their, their rocket wasn't as powerful. They could only send two people, one of whom would stay in the command module, the Soyuz, and the other one would land on the moon. And so uh, the, the prime candidate for that was Leonov. And this is their, their spaceship, uh, which had, like the Apollo, it had a command service module, the Soyuz. It had a lunar module inside this conical thing. But then it had two extra rocket stages to make up for the fact that uh, their rockets weren't as powerful. Uh, and they had a, a very uh, different uh, mission profile that I'm not going to go into uh, in detail, except to say one of the funky things about it was because they didn't do it. So you remember in Apollo, right, they had the command module come out, do a 180, and come back in and dock with the lunar module to get it out of the rocket stage. And that meant that they had a tunnel between the two that the astronauts could crawl through. The Russians didn't do that, and so their astronaut had to get do a spacewalk from the cabin of the command module into the lunar module, just to make it even more sporty. <laughs> um, and then the, uh, the, the lunar module would separate extra rocket stage to get it down near the surface. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, it was an ambitious thing. And although they never launched a m lunar mission attempt, they had real hardware. So this is the, the full spaceship. Here's the, the sort of Soyuz ship. Uh, here is the lunar lander sitting in a museum in Moscow, uh, uh, never having flown to the moon. But they did test it in Earth orbit. They launched the big moon rocket four times. 
It never made it into orbit. The last time was just before Apollo 17. It blew up in the high atmosphere above Kazakhstan. Uh, so uh, that was the end of Soviet lunar ambitions for, for humans. How did we win? Here's my take on this, which is, I want, I want to emphasize again how many launches there were, and not just Apollo 11, right? And so this is all the lunar-related launches, with some caveats. On the left, the Russian launches. On the right, the American launches between 1958 and 1969. And the green ones are the successes, the red ones are the failures. And so what you'll notice is that on the U.S. side, after the mid before the mid-1960s, we were not doing very well. We had a lot of failures. After the mid-1960s, we did awesomely, right? We figured out how to do it. We figured out how to launch missions and have them be successful and have them work. And so our success rate was really good after that. The Russians, not so much. The Russians had a really lousy success rate right up. In fact, 1969 was awful. The, the moon rocket kept blowing up. The proton rocket kept blowing up. They had other failures. Uh, and so this, in a nutshell, was the difference, that the Russians just had too many failures. They couldn't catch up. Uh, and there are reasons that I can go into in more detail, but that's, that, that summarizes the difference in the programs that meant that it wasn't quite as close as we feared it was. And we learned a lot about the moon, the fact that it has internal structure, uh, the fact that the moon rocks are really old on the surface, older than any Earth surface rocks that still survive because of the geology happening on Earth, um, that it was completely molten at one stage. Uh, and it told us, because the rocks are so old, it gives us a record of the early history of the solar system that's since been confirmed by space probes to, to other planets. Uh, and so we really learned a lot about the history of the solar system and, by extension, what happened to Earth that's been erased by geological processes. So we're 50 years on. And we have another American human moon program called Artemis. They just announced this week that that's the new name, uh, the Artemis program to land American astronauts on the moon. Uh, and uh, this is the first stage of the new SLS rocket. It's sort of the replacement for the Saturn V, the new big moon rocket. So there's hardware happening. But to be really honest with you, the funding's really uncertain. The plans are really confused and not settled yet. Uh, the current administration says that we're going to try and get there by 2024, but very few people in the industry believe that that is actually going to happen. Uh, and so we've had several attempts to restart a moon program over the past 20 years, all of which have gotten canceled before seeing anything flying. Uh, we don't know whether the same will be true for this one. Meanwhile, on the far side of the moon right now, uh, this rover, robot rover, is exploring the surface of a crater on the far side of the moon for the first time ever. Uh, a Chinese rover, U-22. So the space race, a new space race, is underway with new players. So it's good. the next few years could get very interesting. And with that, I'll stop. Thank you very much. rockets that didn't get into orbit, did they have cosmonauts aboard? No. Well, they, they never lost anybody during a launch. Um, so that they, uh, they, you know, so they were ready, they had the turtles that flew right, and then they were ready to launch an astronaut, but then they had a failure on a, a, a man test launch or a robotic test launch, and so they went, well, maybe not. And so they never quite got to the point of risking their, their astronauts on one of their really unreliable rockets. Um, and, and that was what delayed them in, in making a human lunar attempt. Uh, um, so with the like um, Russian moon rocket, I've 
for two questions about that. One, how exactly did they get into the lunar module? Was there like a hatch on the outside or did they crawl through that like wire structure and then there was a door on the inside? There's a hatch on the outside. So they get up, they, they, they have a door on the outside of the Soyuz, they get out in their spacesuit, they crawl along, or they crawl along, and then they open a hatch on the outside of the lunar module Okay. And crawl in and close the hatch behind them. Because uh, like there's the white. There's the, yeah, there's, there's a hatch on that too. Yeah, okay. yeah. So you have to open two hatches probably to get through, okay. or maybe they probably there's a dip in the. Uh, I haven't seen it exactly, so I don't know. There may be a dip in the fairing so that the hatch on the lunar module actually is exposed to the outside. That would that would be how I'd design it. Okay. And then my second question was exactly how much um, was there a thrust difference between the Russian moon rocket and then the Saturn V. I don't know the number in Newtons, what I can tell you is this. The Saturn V, right, got into orbit with enough propellant left to send the Apollo spaceship uh, to escape velocity. The M1s, three, three stages, got the L3 spaceship just to Earth orbit and no further. Uh, and so the L3's upper, its own stages had to boost it to the moon. So that's the effective difference. There was a question there in the back there. What technology? Did the Russians fail to develop that we did that sent us to the moon and kept them on the Earth? Um, here's how I see it. The Russians were first at a lot of these things. And we were second and third and fourth and fifth. Right? The Russians did a spectacular, way. we did this first. And then the, instead of going, let's do it again and get really good at it, they went on to the next spectacular. And they never developed the in-depth mastery of the technique. Whereas the US launched many, many more attempts. And even though they didn't get the first one, they did it enough times that they became really good at it. So I think overall, the other thing that they did was right up until the 80s, Russian spaceships had components that were inside a pressurized shell that because uh, uh, they needed air to work. Whereas pretty early on, the US worked through all the horrible problems of getting your electronics to work in a vacuum uh, and stopping it arcing and things like that. And so uh, the uh, one thing that, that, that is really telling is that by the 1970s, American spy satellites operated for maybe six months in orbit. Russian ones were still doing two weeks. Uh, and, and that gives you a sense of like, the durability of their electronics, of their space systems, was just not up to it. So I think that uh, they launched four Mars probes in 1973 uh, with a known electronic chip defect that meant that they all broke at one stage or another during their missions. Um, and, and so th things like that, that, that really meant by the 70s, it was really clear that they were behind. Oh, there were some uh, over there. At, at what moment did the service module um, jettison the um, command module? Um, the command module right. jettison the service module. So the service module's engine is what gets them out of lunar orbit back toward the Earth. But it also kind of protects the heat shield from external uh, problems. And so they actually got rid of it about 10 minutes before re-entry, or maybe an hour before re-entry, something like that. So they're coming in, they dump the service module, and then they orient for re-entry. Um, so it's right at the last minute. There's a question there in the back. Right. Yeah, so I'm just wondering, is there a difference in funding between the two programs? Because obviously both really wanted to win the race. So yeah, was well, there a difference in funding? That's a great question. Okay, it's really hard to compare the economic systems, right? Um, I think the bigger problem in the Soviet Union was actually that Korolev's biggest rivals were not the Americans. It was two other rival uh, um, designers who had their own moon programs, uh, Chalamet uh, and Yangel, uh, who owned, there were basically three space programs in Russia, each with their own patrons in the Politburo that, that uh, ran the Soviet Union. And so depending on who was on top in the internal political wars, their favorite rocket program got the money. And so that kind of went back and forth during the 60s. And, and so that was one of many problems. Also, the big problem with the Russian rocket 
was that it had many, many small engines instead of a few big engines. The reason they had that was that the guy who could build the big engines, Glushko, was the guy who had sold Korolev out to the, the purges back in Stalin's time and ended them up in a prison camp. And so they didn't like each other very much. And they worked together, but they had a fight. And so Korolev went with the other guy to build his rocket engines for the moon rocket, and he couldn't build the big ones. And so it was stuff like that that really hosed them uh, at one stage or another. Uh, you had a question, I know. Yes. Um, do you have a theory about why there has been such a perpetuation of this landing being a hoax? It is so tiresome, and I, every time I talk to some, some random person, they're like, you know, I, that never happened. I'm yeah, like, I mean, they're idiots. Why? What can I say? I have no <laughs> It is so insulting is so to people like Clark who spent their careers making this happen. That's why I emphasize you know, this happened all over the US. It happened with tens of thousands of people. There's so much hardware, there were so many launches. So anyone who doesn't believe that is kind of, you know, has an issue that's not the facts. You know, that I, I think that's that's that, that's my yeah. Why did we stop the moon program? And what, why is it getting restarted? What does it mean by going back? Why, why did it stop? Why is it being restarted? And very different question, what is it again? Yeah. Um, and so why did it stop? Uh, we were spending a lot of money uh, in a place in Southeast Asia. Uh, <laughs> that uh, that made it hard for Congress to find the funds, and also, you know, public interest by the second moon landing was like, are we doing this again? <laughs> Going to another world? We did that already. Why bother? Right? It, it, it's it's uh, uh, we're going to another world. <laughs> no, 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 boring. Okay, um, and and so. Um, uh, then the other thing, uh, uh, why we're we going back? Because um, the human spaceflight program is uh, a great political grandstanding thing that you can get publicity for and say your administration did something awesome. Uh, why should we go back? What can we gain? Um, you know, there are a lot of reasons to return to the moon. There's a lot we still don't know scientifically about the moon. I think, don't think that's a reason to send humans back. We could send robots to do that. Uh, but I do, like Elon Musk, I believe that we should be a multi-planetary species. I think that it's important that humanity stops being just on the Earth. Not to solve our current problems of how we're screwing up the planet, because we've got to do that. That is a much longer term issue of bad things happen to good planets in the long run. <laughs> and we should, in, in, a, in the you know, m millennia kind of time scale, we should really be a multi-planetary species. And so the moon is a good test place for that because it's only three days away. If things go wrong, you know, it's a lot easier to get home than if you're on Mars. <laughs> and so it's a good place to learn how to operate Far from home, but not so far from home that that your frequent flyer miles won't be enough to get you. Um, so I think that's 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 my answer. Uh, and and we've learned a lot more about how you could when we go back. The idea is to go back sustainably to stay, use learn how to use lunar resources to uh, so you don't have to keep importing things from Earth, things like that. Uh, that we know that there's water at the South Pole. Whether you can get it out is another matter. Um, uh, it's all you know, in the eye in the rock, uh, but but there's all kinds of reasons why a new moon expedition would be very different from the Apollo reconnaissance. Oh yeah. Um, so Apollo orbited 100 kilometers above the moon, right? Correct. So what were the uh, parameters or the physics involved in making that determination? Was going to be 100 kilometers, not 120 or 80? Yeah, I don't think it would have mattered that level, but why not a thousand, why not ten? So you want to be above the mountains, and it turned out that, to our surprise, when we first flew the lunar orbiter robot probes in the mid-60s, the moon's gravity is very lumpy, more so than the Earth. Beneath the Maria, the big impact basins, 
there's over densities uh, due to the way that the magma, re I don't know what, I'm not a geologist. Um, <clears throat> and so what that means is that if you start off in a 100 kilometer circular orbit, you pass over these mass concentrations, these mass cons, pretty soon you're not, you're in a 10 by 200 kilometer elliptical orbit, and that might not go so well, because then the next week you're in a minus two by something <laughs> orbit, and that goes badly. Um, and, <clears throat> and so you don't want to get too low because of that, uh, but you don't want to get too high because then it's harder to get down to the surface, I guess. And you can't also, you can't do your reconnaissance as well. You want to be close enough to be able to see the landing site clearly and make sure that it's, it's friendly. Oh. Yeah, one question from up there. <coughs> Why is it that the Soviet engineering seems to result in everything being circles on their, you know, their uh, spacecraft? Why is that? Um, well, circles and cylinders are, are most spacecraft, really. But, I mean, it doesn't uh, appear that the, the... I mean, they don't show up as much. I mean, you looked at their lander, uh, the, the, what they sent up, it was just a whole bunch of circles sphere. everywhere. Yeah, they, they had the spheres. Module circle. Well, well, a sphere is a very sturdy, you know, thing if you're pressurized. Mm -hmm. Whereas the lunar module, uh, I guess also this, they weren't going for let's get every ounce of weight off. Mm -hmm. Because uh, they they were they didn't have that level of engineering, whereas the lunar module is this weird shape mm -hmm. because it's designed for vacuum and it's designed to have no extra grams of stuff. And the, the kind of the saying was always that the wall of the lunar module, if Armstrong wasn't careful, you know, he could put his hand through it. Yeah. Right. And and so um, and so I think they just weren't at that level of uh, paring everything down to the last gram, and they made things the simple way. And in general, I think the difference in style is the U.S. tries to go for the most technically advanced engineering to save the last, you know, 1%, right? Mm. And the Soviet approach is, let's bang a bunch of iron together and make sure it's sturdy. <laughs> yeah. uh, and that's a caricature of both, but, but it gives you a flavor of the differences. I think we can... I can hang out to answer right. more questions afterwards, but we better let people go, so yeah. Well, thank you.